So in Matthew chapter number two, and one, one thing we're going to notice as we go through this, especially in the uh, early chapters in the book of Matthew, maybe even more so than the other Gospels, I'm not sure I haven't um, actually studied out to compare where they're at, but we see a lot of references to the Old Testament. And you see a lot of prophecies being, you know, coming true, especially revolving around the birth of Jesus Christ. We're going to see a lot of, that's why we see so many of them right up front. We saw some last week. That's why we went through the genealogy, starting with Abraham, because that was fulfilling prophecy of Christ being born. And then into chapter number two here, we're seeing some more prophecies being uh, played out. Now, as we begin in chapter number two, we're getting into a uh, you know, very famous story, the birth of Christ. This is, this is a very familiar story, especially in the United States of America. You know, with so many Christians in this country, you hear the Christmas story, the birth of Christ over and over and over again. The wise men come from the east and, you know, oftentimes you'll see the, the nativity scenes with the manger and a baby Jesus laying and the star, you know, and, and this is a very familiar story to us. One thing that we see as we study scripture is, um, and we're going to get into this in a little bit, you know, we hear always about the three wise men and, um, there's even a song that we, we sing around Christmas time, We Three Kings of Orient Are. And um, you always hear that there's three of them, which Scripture doesn't exactly say that. We'll get into that in a little bit. But I want to focus, first of all, since verses 1 and 2, look down in your Bible there in Matthew chapter 2. Verse number 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, the Bible says here that they were wise men that came from the east. And the reason why I'm making a point about this, and this kind of is, we're going to get into this again a little bit more right at the end of this chapter. But we at, at, at Stronghold Baptist Church, we believe that the King James Version of the Bible in the English language is the Word of God. There are many different translations out there in English. There's many different translations in other languages as well. We don't believe that the Bible is only pres preserved in English. But what we're saying is that for the English-speaking world, the Bible for us is the King James Version of the Bible because we believe that that version has been preserved through God's providence, through God doing the preserving of his word in the English language. That God has maintained his word as he promised to do. As the scripture says, there's many places in scripture, uh, one of the more famous ones in the book of Psalm, where the Bible says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the Bible leaves the preservation of God's word to God. God's responsibility is to preserve it. Now, I understand that there are, uh, you know, humans are flawed. Human beings are imperfect. If, it, if everything was completely left up to us, I don't think humanity could perfectly preserve, you know, those words exactly for millennia. That's right. All right. Just completely left up to ourselves, I don't think that would be possible. And I think that's a, a valid point to make when people want to say, oh, there's, you know, there's errors in Scripture. But when you understand and you read the scripture and you say, well, if God is the one that's keeping his word, well, just as much as God is able to use man and has used man when he delivered his word, God used people like Moses. God used people like David. God used people like the Apostle Paul. The Bible says holy men of God spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. So God was working through sinful man, through imperfect man to deliver his perfect words. And just as much as God is capable of doing that through his messengers, through his prophets, God has also been able to maintain that word through translators, through men who have been able to copy down God's word. Now, I don't think that is such great of a stretch to believe that. I think that's very reasonable 
to believe that that's a case. And I think scripture proves that. Now, I don't want to get too deep into that tonight because there's a lot in Matthew chapter 2. But I'm bringing this up because there are other versions of the Bible out there that people are using. And one of the things that, that I've heard quite a bit of is that these three wise men, you know, when people want to sound smart, they go, oh, well, those were magi. And that's actually, they're getting that from Bibles like the NIV. Yeah. And that's why I, as Brother Carter was reading, I, I didn't even have this planned, but because uh, I already knew that, that these types of things were out there, but I have a copy of the, the New Living, the, li, or the Living Bible and the NIV right here, a parallel Bible back, in, you know, side by side. And they both say um, that it's the Magi. So in, in the NIV, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And there's a little asterisk there. And then at the bottom it says, Traditionally wise men. So like, well, traditionally it's always been called wise. They've always been called wise men, but we're calling them Magi. You know, supposedly the NIV is supposed to be easier to understand. Well, what's easier to understand, magi or wise men? Now, I think obviously wise men is a lot easier to understand, but not just that. Magi is referring to something a little bit different. When you do a study on, you know, wise men or magi even in the Bible, there are times where you can use the word wise to describe people who were, who were magi or sorcerers or astrologers, but usually the people associating you know wise men with that with those people were heathen kings so like pharaoh had his wise men and his astrologers and his people who used enchantments that uh, that were you know using synonymously those those terms but i think in the king james bible here what we see because these men are looking for jesus they're looking for the king of the jews these were not your sorcerers or wizards or people who dealt with familiar spirits, right? These people that, that God has strictly forbidden in his law, you know, the, that witches are to be, to be put to death, the Bible says. There's a very, very severe punishment on people who practice these curious arts and these magicians. It doesn't make sense to me that some magician out in the east is going to be looking for the king of the Jews. It's going to be looking for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The reason why the Bible says they're wise men is because they're wise through the scripture of God. They were wise in studying out God's word and looking for that Messiah and knowing that, hey, it's got to be coming soon where it's time for the Messiah to be showing up on this earth. And that's why they were looking and seeking for the Messiah. And they were wise. They were wise according to the scripture. And um, even in, in the, I was a little surprised, this, the Living Bible says, instead of using Magi, it says, Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some astrologers from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? So here it's just flat out just calling them astrologers. And again, I don't think that's right. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to have the right Bible. Because as you're reading these different things, you're going to have different understanding even of, of who these people are. Now, this may not be the most important issue on whether you call them wise men or magi or even astrologers. That's not the most important issue. It's just one point that I'm pointing out. There are multitudes and multitudes and multitudes more examples just like this and worse when you start looking at the different versions. It is really important which book you're going to call God's word. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you have two books, they're going to stamp the Holy Bible as, as what it is, defining what type of book that is. This is the Holy Bible. This is the Holy Bible. This is the Holy Bible. And those books, if you put them side by side and you could find places where they say the exact opposite thing, I'm not even saying, oh, well, here it says Magi, here it says Wise Men. I'm talking about the exact opposite thing. Like one uses the positive and one uses the negative. They can't both be God's word. That is impossible. You, you just cannot say, well, they're both God's word. 
Look it up for yourself. I, I'm, I don't want to spend all night on this subject. We're going to get back to it. But what's really interesting here is, um, well, we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, just regarding people who are wise, when it says the wise men came, they came from the east. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, verse number 7, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom, I have led thee in right paths. And that last verse there, I've taught thee in the way of wisdom. Wisdom leads you in the right path. These wise men were looking to be led to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They were wise. They were looking at the scriptures. They were looking for the Messiah. And it wasn't even just them. You know, many uh, people were looking for the Messiah. Even the woman at the well, when she was talking to Jesus, she said, well, we know that Messiah's cometh. And when he cometh, he'll show us all things. And, and other people were looking for the Messiah. Even in this chapter, you know, Herod is really worried about the fact that the king of the Jews, who was prophesied in the Old Testament, may have been born and that people are looking for him. This is something that was well understood in those days. And one of the things that we shouldn't get too worried about, a lot of people want to go back and say, well, how do you, you know, asking all these questions about what people knew in the Old Testament. Well, well how did you, how, I bet, you know, I have people ask me, how did they explain to someone how to be saved? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I do know that the Bible is very clear that salvation has always been by grace through faith, that it's never been of works. The book of Hebrews said that the blood of bulls and of goats have never been able to save. They've never been able to wash away sin. It's never been possible that Jesus has always been pictured in all of those sacrifices, in all of the law, in everything that happened. Jesus Christ was a picture. He was the focal point. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness over and over and over again through Scripture. So, I know that much. So whatever it is that they said, going all the way back to Adam and Eve when men began to call upon the name of the Lord, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? They believed on the Lord for their salvation and they called upon him. That's how people got saved. I don't have to know the exact words that they use or the exact scriptures that they turn to. I don't know. Their understanding of scripture is different than ours even though it's the same truth. And what I mean by that is that we have a lot more information now and we could see things much clearer. In the New Testament, we have so much more revealed to give us more understanding and a much clearer defined picture of exactly what is true. They had the same truths, just not quite as clear. They didn't know the name of Jesus Christ, but they knew a Savior was coming. There's other things they didn't know. A lot of them didn't understand that when Jesus was coming the first time, they kind of mixed together the second coming of Jesus Christ with the first coming of Jesus Christ, and they didn't quite know. And I could understand that. We have the luxury now of, of being where we are in time to see, oh yeah, of course, it's clear. You know, there's a first coming of Christ and then the second coming of Christ. But a lot of the people at the time of Christ wanted to make him king. I mean, they was looking for the king of the Jews, which he was. But he wasn't coming to establish his kingdom on this earth when he came the first time. But guess what? He's coming back and he's going to do that the second time. So when people were looking at prophecy, they weren't able to, to really put the big picture together. And some, you know, when you're looking at the prophetic events before Jesus even arrived, how would you? It's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to understand that. So uh, we don't need to get caught up in how everyone did everything back then. We know they did, and we know that there was holy men of God that were, that were preaching God's word and helping to give the understanding. So um, let's keep reading here. Now, one thing that we're going to notice, I already mentioned this, um, is all of the Old Testament scriptures and references. Um, let's look at verse number three here, in, excuse me, in Matthew number two, chapter two. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So these wise men show up, from the east and they're saying, hey, we're looking for him that's born king of the Jews. This bothers Herod, but not just Herod, it says 
and all Jerusalem with them. So, you know, the news gets out that these, these travelers came into town and they're looking for the king of the Jews. A lot of people are worried about that. This really shakes people up just by hearing this news. Verse 4 says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Again, just proving evidence. They already were looking for a savior because that's why he brings together the scribes, the chief priests, all the religious leaders of the time in the Jews' religion trying to get them together to say, hey, okay, what is the deal with this Christ? Where is he going to be born exactly? I need to know this. Why? Because the king is worried that there's another king being born, a king that was going to have the power of God on him and was going to you know, usurp his authority, and he didn't want that to happen. He's worried about losing his position as the king. And um, so he brings together these, you know, supposed experts on the scripture. He's asking the scribes, he's asking the Pharisees, he's asking the chief priests to find out, hey, where is this going to happen? And they know, they answer him. In verse number five, the Bible says, and they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. And that is what the scripture says. It says, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And that is a reference to an Old Testament scripture in Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. That is the reference. In Micah 5, 2, the Bible says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And then it goes on to say, because they didn't quote the entire passage, it says, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So the fact that the Savior was going to come and that that Savior was God in the flesh was known and prophesied from the Old Testament, which is really interesting because it's, it's known that the Jews of today they claim they were never looking for God to become a man as their savior. They were never looking for God in the flesh. At that time, nor now, you know, the, the, the religion of the Pharisees, the religion that rejected Jesus Christ, it wasn't all of the Jews. And, we, and here's where I need to differentiate the difference between someone who is ethnically a Jew Someone who is a Jew because they were born of the seed of Israel or born of the seed of Abraham. Of that group of people, you have many people who believed on Jesus Christ and you have many people who did not. And it's the religion of the Jews, the religion more specifically of the Pharisees of that time, the Pharisees that rejected Jesus Christ, the Pharisees that ordered Jesus Christ to be put to death that rejected the Messiah and said, you know, his blood be on us and on our children. Those wicked people, those are the ones that rejected and those are the ones that were not even expecting God in the flesh to be their savior. They were just looking for a man. But even in the Old Testament, and, and that's why I think it's interesting, they didn't quote the rest of that verse. Because who is, who is Herod calling? He's calling the Pharisees. He's calling the scribes. He's calling these people who Jesus was railing against. They knew this passage, but they stopped short of saying, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Amen. Goings forth from everlasting, that's like the Bible talks about Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without beginning of days or end of life. Right. Jesus Christ is eternal. God is eternal. No human being is eternal like that. We all have a starting point where God has created us. Jesus was not a creation of God because Jesus is God. Jesus is God incarnate. So I just I found that to be pretty interesting too. But again, we see these passages from the Old Testament being fulfilled and they get brought up multiple times in this in this chapter. Let's keep reading here in verse number seven. The Bible says, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So he finds out where the Savior is supposed to be born 
And then he finds out, well, what, when exactly did you see that star? So he's trying to get a timeline of when Jesus was born. Because he figures, well, when they saw the star, that's probably when Jesus was born. And obviously, if they're traveling from the east, it's going to take some time to get all the way to Jerusalem. You know, however long it took them, a month or however, whatever, however many weeks it took them to make that journey, however far away they were in the east. doesn't really say. We're not, we don't know that. But uh, Herod would have known to be able to make that type of a, of a guess because he wants to know. The reason why he wants to know is because he wants to stamp out Jesus Christ. He wants to kill him. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So he doesn't want to let on his evil intent. And he tells them, Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I want to worship him too. Let me know. As soon as you find him, though, let, you know, make sure you find out where he is, but then you come back and tell me, and I want to worship him too. Now, when the... Uh, when the wise men show up, though, this is one thing that's kind of interesting as well. The wise men show up, they just start asking, you know, hey, where's the king of the Jews? And no one was able to tell them. So what that tells me is not very many people were watching. Right? They were watching. They were wise men from the east, but not everyone was, was necessarily looking for that. You know, people kind of knew it was going to come, but these guys were diligent looking. They probably figured, well, it takes us so long to get there anyways. You know, other people are going to see this star or other, you know, other people will be watching for him. So when we show up, we should, all we need to do is ask. No, they had to find him. So they're, they're like, okay, well, where is he, right? And no one knew, no one knows. So now in verse number nine, it says, when they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So now they're really happy because... No one's able to tell them where they were, but then they see the star again. The star appears that leads them right over to the place where Jesus Christ was so that they can go and uh, be led to the Messiah and bring their gifts to him. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And this is where people get the idea that there were three wise men, basically because we have three gifts being mentioned here. So people just kind of think, well, one person brought gold, one person brought frankincense, one person brought myrrh. It's not a, it's not a bad thought. We just, the, the bottom line is we just don't really know. So it's not something you could be dogmatic about. Maybe there were three. Maybe there were four. Maybe there were two. Maybe there were five. You know, probably wasn't a huge group, but doesn't have to necessarily just be three because maybe two guys brought gold, you know. But either way, they're bringing him these, you know, royal gifts, these expensive gifts, these nice things um, to bestow upon Jesus Christ. And then God warns them in a dream not to go back to Herod because God knows Herod's evil intent. These guys didn't really get that, that Herod was intent on killing him. So God warns them in a dream. It says in verse 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So they, made, they didn't even go by, like they made sure they weren't gonna be found by anyone of Herod's house, you know, as they're traveling back through town. We were just like, all right, well, where is he? They, they just go and kind of skip out of town another way and go back home so as not to be seen and, and, uh, and they just get out of there. Verse number 13, the Bible says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So now Joseph is being warned in a dream because Herod is bent on destruction. He's bent on killing Jesus Christ. And when we see what he does in just a minute, Verse number 14 says, When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And it's just amazing how many things happen, how many events that seemingly have nothing to do with one another. How would anyone know that Herod is going to try to destroy Jesus? How is anyone going to know all these different things? Well, because God knows everything. And because this is God's word, and this is one of the great things, you know, people, 
I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but people want to find the smallest things in the Bible to tear apart, to justify not having faith in God's word, and completely ignore the mountain of evidence suggesting that this really is the word of God. We have scripture after scripture after scripture being fulfilled just in the birth of Christ, just in a few short, you know, this, this short period of time around his birth, from verses from prophets that came hundreds and even thousands of years prior to Christ's birth, all being fulfilled in this very short period of time. That is amazing. How can you say that that is not the Word of God? And some of these, you know, they don't always, they're not all as obvious, but some of them are. The one that said, you know, from, who's, who's uh, coming, going forth from, from everlasting, like, that's pretty powerful. This isn't like Nostradamus. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Nostradamus. I haven't heard anything about his predictions in a while, but the last time I think I heard anything about Nostradamus' predictions was like when the uh, trade towers were hit. Right? Someone found something to try to tie in, like, oh, Nostradamus predicted this you know, back whenever. But if you ever looked at them, they're so lame. They're so, like, like they're so general, his predictions. And you could almost apply them to anything. Like, they're not very specific. But when you look in the Bible, you get some very specific things. What's really interesting, too, is that, you know, with Nostradamus, you can apply one thing here and one thing over there and just all over this huge span of time and try to find some leader somewhere, some famous person to try to apply what he said to. This is all being applied to one person in a very short period of time, all coming back from different writers at different periods of time, all pointing to one person and being very specific about it. That's what's amazing about God's word. This is one of the proofs that the Bible is the word of God. One of my favorite proofs is, is in the book of the Kings where the Bible prophesies Josiah, who was to come about 400 years in the future. So back when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, built up that altar, and the man of God came and preached against him, right? And when, when Jeroboam reached forth his hand and, and he made his hand basically stiff, when he's like, get that man. And then the man of God prayed, you know, they'd be healed. The man of God said that there was going to be a man born that was going to rend the altar and, uh, and, and burn the bones of, of the priests on that altar. And he said he's going to be um, Josiah by name. He names him some 400 years before it actually happened. And, uh, you know, I was at Word of Truth Baptist Church while I was preaching a sermon, but it's like today, okay, we're in, you know, 2019, let's say in the 1600s, someone were to say, there's going to be a president in the United States of America, which didn't exist. Or let's just, let's just say whatever. Let's say it did exist, right? And he's going to be Donald, Donald by name. And then all of a sudden, we, you know, it's... And then and he's going to do... He's going to build a wall. <laughs> whatever, right? It, that is a similar type of event that took place where he's saying Josiah's going to come and it's not just there's going to be a king named Josiah because someone could name their kid Josiah just to try to fit along with the story, which nobody did, by the way. None of the kings did that, intentionally tried to name their son Josiah. In fact, Josiah came along after a slew of, of some wicked kings, after Manasseh, who was king for a very long time and was not following the Lord. And um, he did exactly what was prophesied. And he wasn't even thinking about fulfilling the prophecy he came across these, these tombs because he's just doing all this stuff, trying to get right with God. And then they're like, oh, and whose grave is this? Oh, that's the man of God that prophesied all these things that you're doing right now. Okay, well, leave, leave those bones alone. Right? So it's, it's incredible. The amount of proof there is in Scripture for the Bible being God's Word is amazing. 
And we get to see so many different evidences of this, yet people want to point to one thing and say, oh, well, this can't be God's word because whatever. And we're going we're to see one of those examples at the, very, at the very end of the chapter here. There's always something in Scripture that people want to turn to to not believe it. It's there. Yeah, that's right. It's there. But there's so much more that any reasonable person can say, yes, this is the Word of God. And it doesn't even have to be some huge leap of faith. Right. Yes, there's faith involved. Yes, you do have to believe. It is not 100% proven beyond any shadow of a doubt. You do have to have faith. But it is not some total blind faith that's just irrational, unbelievable, you know, well, I'm just going to believe it anyways. Yeah. No, it actually makes a lot of sense. Right. Let's keep reading here. In, uh, well, in, so that, that verse that says, Out of Egypt have I called my son, is reference is a, is a passage from Hosea 11. The Bible says, When Israel was a child and I loved him and called my son, out of Egypt. That's the, that's the verse that they're quoting in Matthew chapter 2. Look at verse number 16 here. The Bible says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So Herod's given these wise men some time to kind of search, search out and seek Jesus Christ and find him and then get back to him. But after a while, he's realizing these wise men aren't coming back. Like, they're gone. And they've been gone for a while because he decides to just say, well, since they're not going to tell me where he is and he hadn't found out yet where he was, he knows where he was supposed to be born and he knows about the time frame. So he basically he says, okay, it's been you know, a year and a half since I've heard anything. So basically, any child two years old and under they're just all going to be put to death in Bethlehem and in the coast in case, they, in case they, they ventured out a little bit. And he's just making sure that, that, they're all, that, that he's going to be put to death. That's the way that he is, uh, is dealing with that. And that was, that was horrible. Very, very wicked, uh, very wicked thing that Herod did. But this was also prophesied in the scripture. Verse number 17 says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. So this, this is the event where there is great lamentation, great weeping over these children that were murdered by King Herod. Um, prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. That's where the reference comes from. Jeremiah 31, 15 says, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel weeping for her children refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Now, and this is one of the things that people will look to and say, oh, well, you know, it's not a word for word exact quotation from the Old Testament. And they'll just say, well, that, that can't be right then. But it, it is. This is. They're basically saying the same thing. And when you have the translation going from Greek to Hebrew, uh, it's the way that a word for word works out isn't always going to be identical words, but they're synonyms. I mean, you're getting the same exact thought across. And that, and, and the, you know, almost no translation of the Bible is an exact, literal, word-for-word -word translation. It just wouldn't make any sense. You have to have a level of understanding what does this say and what does that mean in this language. What you have to look out for is in a translation, especially when people are adding their doctrines and adding their meaning to the words as opposed to just, well, this is what it says in this language and I'm going to translate that into this language and not adding any of their own understanding or interpretation to the passage to try to make it sound better or make it fit. Um, let's keep reading a verse number. Well, here, um, in Jeremiah 31, that was where the reference came, but I thought this was also interesting if these, because oftentimes you'll see passages quoted in the Old Testament where it's pretty much that one verse kind of standing alone being the prophecy 
and, and then the rest of the passage is dealing other, with other things going on at that time. But if the next two verses, which I think they can be applied for this same time period where Herod kills his children, they're kind of interesting. I'm going to read those for you. So Jeremiah 31, 15 says, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, refer, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded. Thus saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. And we see, even in the midst of this really horrible event, the hope that God is putting in them back in Jeremiah 31. I think it's the same hope that they can, they can get, get during that time that the Savior was born and that the victor is coming and that he's going to be able to bring their children back. You know, and, and these children that were killed, obviously they were young. They didn't know right from wrong. They're going to be uh, brought back eventually anyways at the resurrection. They are, they are saved. There is no, um, you know, when the child is that young, they don't know uh, good from evil. They don't know right from wrong. They haven't transgressed the law until they've been able to understand right from wrong and then, and then be able to sin against God. So there is that, um, that comfort as well. And then the comfort of just knowing that the Savior has arrived. So let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter 2. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, we're going to spend the rest of the sermon basically on this one point. As we've read, I've given you all of the references from the Old Testament where there's been references, you know, prophesying the, the birth of Jesus Christ or all these different events that happened. This last one here is not written in the Old Testament. This passage where it says, it was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. You'll notice in the other verses, it'll say the prophet, like singular, it'll say, as the prophet said, or, you know, and you could find out, oh yeah, that's in Micah. Oh yeah, that's in Jeremiah. That's in Isaiah. And you could find the prophet that said that and where it was written down. This one says it was fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, plural. So more than one witness, more than one person was preaching about this, but it wasn't written down and recorded in the Old Testament. But we don't have to worry about this being an issue. And this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier. When someone, because people who hate God and hate the Bible, one of the things they like to do is try to shake Christians' faith in the Word of God. That's one thing Satan likes to do too. He's done that from the very beginning. Satan is the one that went to Eve and said, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did, did he really say that and start to cause question and doubt on what God's word says before he comes flat out and says, well, surely you, can, you, know, you, could eat, you, know, you could eat of any of the trees and just lies about what God said. Right. Instead of, and, you know, and, and obviously there, the Bible says that the, Satan is the father of lies and uh, there is no truth in him. But so what we see here is when you, you know, someone will come across this and say, well, see, there's no, it's not in the Old Testament. So this, is, this can't be the word of God then because it says it was spoken by the prophets, but then it wasn't, it's not, where is it? Well, it doesn't say it was written by the prophets. It said it was spoken by the prophets. And it's written in the book of Matthew. You'll say, well, how does Matthew know about this stuff? It doesn't matter how Matthew knows. 
it, it was spoken by the prophets and it is written in the book of Matthew. Now, how did we receive the Bible? I already quoted this verse earlier. 2 Peter 1, 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon the person and they spake the word of God through the power of the Holy Ghost. Not their own words, not their own power, but the Holy Ghost came upon them so that they can speak the word of God. Hebrews chapter 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So basically, in the Old Testament, it's saying God used different ways of speaking to people. Sometimes he would appear to people in dreams. Sometimes he would audibly speak so that a person could hear him. Sometimes God would use someone else to speak to that person and speak in the name of the Lord. There's different ways that God used to speak uh, unto the fathers here by the prophets. And then it says in verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So he's saying there's all these different ways that God's used to kind of give us his word. And then these last days, Jesus Christ himself, his son, came and spake to us, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we've received the word of God in different ways. But it's not really the manner of how you get the word of God as much as the content of the word of God. The content of the word of God is provable. The prophecies that come true, we know that's of God. All the words, the Bible says that you can, you can test them. The person who says he's a prophet, but when he says words and he says, oh, God said this, but it doesn't come to pass, that's not of God. And watch out. Watch out for the preachers that stand up behind the pulpit in the house of God and say, oh, I had a dream last night and God told me that you have to put that money in the offering plate. And God told me that fill in the blank. We're going to get this big building and you're going to be healed. And you're, you know, watch out for the people that say, God told me this. Why don't you actually look and see, does that actually happen what they're saying? Because that is the sign of a false prophet right there. Watch out for those people they say things that sound really great to try to win people over, to try to get people all hyped up, and they're liars. That's right. If God said it, you know where it is? It's going to be right here. God has spoken through his prophets, and we have his word here. If someone says, God told me this, well... Let's go past the book of Revelation now and start writing down whatever that was because that's the word of God. If God actually said that, I'm going to say, oh, the book according to uh, David Burson's right here. Right? I mean, the Mormons have a book like that called the Book of Mormon. They say that's still happening. It's exactly what they say. That those are the words of God. Big problem with that, though. They contradict Scripture. They contradict the other words of God. See, in order for the words of God to be God's word, they can't be contradictory to each other. They have to all fit together. Because God doesn't just make those kinds of mistakes. Humans do. False prophets do all the time. But God doesn't. And one of the beautiful things that we have is an inerrant Bible because it is the word of God. There are no errors in the King James Version of the Bible. There's none. Zero. I preach entire sermons going over so-called errors where people want to throw out, oh, well, it has this number here and this number here. That's not right. That's not true. And like I said before, people want to strain in a gnat and try to find the smallest things and they swallow the camel of all of the evidence showing you that this is God's word. But they'll strain at the small thing. They'll strain at this verse and say, oh, yeah, well, the prophet said this. Where is that in the Old Testament? See, not God's word. And they just want to throw everything away. Instead of just maybe thinking that maybe you just don't understand exactly what that says. And if there's ever a verse in the Bible you find like, oh, I don't really understand that. It's okay. You don't have to understand every single thing that the book says. But you ought to come to a place where you're convinced this is the word of God and stand on it. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Word. 
And Jesus Christ is a sure foundation. Jesus Christ is the rock upon which we stand, upon which our faith rests. We can be unwavering in that faith. And just as much as you can be strong and solid in the belief in Jesus Christ, you can be strong and solid in the Word of God. Amen. And there are false Christs and false prophets out there trying to impersonate Jesus Christ, trying to tell you that they're the second coming of Jesus Christ, trying to tell you all these different things. People are making up different men, different prophets, calling them Jesus Christ. The Mormon Jesus Christ is not Jesus Christ. That's just a man. That's not God in the flesh. The Jehovah's Witness Jesus Christ is not the real Jesus Christ. People will come at you with these different things just as much today as people are coming at you with different books and saying, this is the Holy Bible. This is the Holy Bible. This is the Holy Bible. Oh, we uncovered some more documents here. Now we actually have the truth. No, God hasn't been hiding his word under a rock for thousands of years. It's been in use. It's been passed down. It's gone from church to church. It has a progression and has been used and has not been lost over time. That's right, right? Amen. And it's ridiculous to think that it has been. These modern translations, some of them are coming from one of the, one, uh, one of the source documents. The document literally was in a trash can in a Catholic church. It's not a joke. It's funny, but it's not a joke. That's, that's the truth. Look it up for yourself. Yeah, amen. Yeah, right. What someone thought was trash in a Catholic church, just because it's old, people later are going to say, oh, hey, let's look at this. And, and this is where the Word of God's been hiding. Let's use this in our translations. The reason why Matthew 2.23 is not a problem is for the same reason that Jude 14 and 15 is not a problem. The book of Jude, turn there if you would. Right before the book of Revelation, All the way near the end of the Bible, you can find the book of Jude. One chapter, not very big. Verses 14 and 15, we're going to see a quotation from Enoch. And guess what? We don't have a book of Enoch. I know there's a book of Enoch that exists out there because people found this passage and, and someone decided to write a whole book and, and pass it off as the Word of God. It's not the Word of God. But you know what? This is the Word of God. And you could say, well, how did Jude know what Enoch said? I mean, Enoch, that's going back before, that's pre-flood, okay? Jude wasn't around during that time. And I would guess that this even wasn't verbally transmitted from that time all the way out throughout the generations of this time. I don't believe that. What I do believe is that as Jude was penning down the book of Jude, the Holy Spirit was upon him so that he was able to speak the word of God or to write the word of God and to know what Enoch was preaching through the Holy Ghost Amen. and give that to us today. Jude verse 14, the Bible says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, saying, so this is what he's saying, this is what Enoch said. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch said those things. Jude wrote them down in the New Testament. Enoch spake those things way back in the Old Testament. I'd be willing to bet that prophets have said things under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that had not been written down yet. Like, he's going to dwell in a city, he's going to be uh, dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled with spoken of prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. That as the prophets were prophesying of Jesus Christ being born, of the Messiah coming, of the Christ coming, that he was going to be called a Nazarene. And it hadn't gotten written down yet. And it didn't get written down until Matthew wrote it down but it's still the Word of God. The Word of God was being delivered. And the Word of God doesn't have to come just one time, and that's it. We see, what about with, uh, 
when, when the word of God got thrown in the fire. Write back up and write another one. Same exact thing. God's not like, oh, well, you blew it, forget it. What about when Moses broke the Ten Commandments that were graven in stone? Cast them down. Guess what? They got another Ten Commandments. And they weren't different Ten Commandments. They were the same ones. God gave them to him again. He didn't come, oh, well, forget that. Okay, yeah, those other Ten Commandments, now we're just going to come up with ten brand new commandments because you already screwed those up. No, God's word is God's word. And, he, and you know, he can keep giving them over and over again. Now, what's really interesting, because there's a lot of different thoughts from people who just can't understand how this can be God's word. So they'll tell you things, and this is why you got to watch out when you don't understand something, going online and searching through all these different commentaries and all these other people who aren't even saved giving you their opinion about what this means. Some people will tell you, oh, well, Nazarene, really it means he was a Nazarite. And I preached a whole sermon on the Nazarite vow, like Samson was a Nazarite from his mother's womb, which means he didn't eat any grapes, he didn't drink any wine, he didn't have anything of the vine, and he didn't cut his hair. And this is, I think, the reason why people put that image up of Jesus Christ having long hair, is because of this false belief that he's a Nazarite. But being a Nazarite has nothing to do with being a Nazarene. A Nazarene is just someone from Nazareth. It has nothing to do with being a Nazarite. A Nazarite was someone who took a vow. Jesus Christ was not a Nazarite. The Bible records, he says, you know, John the Baptist, he was. The Bible says that he came not, you know, eating, not eating or drinking. But Jesus came eat, both eating and drinking. Jesus was not a Nazarite. And the Bible says it's a shame for a man. That's not even nature itself teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Jesus didn't have long hair. Now, if the Bible says it's a shame, Jesus didn't have it. But what I think is really interesting here is that there's enough places in the Bible just like the Pharisees to point to and justify their unbelief because that's exactly what the Pharisees did with the fact that Jesus came out of Galilee, came out of Nazareth. Turn to John chapter 7. It's the last place you'll look at tonight. They've rejected the overwhelming evidence. See, the Pharisees had Jesus on the scene performing miracles, healing sick, feeding multitudes, healing those who were lame from birth, those that were blind he gave sight to, the deaf he, he gave, you know, opened up their ears. He preached the gospel, he ministered to the poor, he did all of these great works through the power of the Holy Ghost. And they rejected all of that all of that. And you know what they did? They pointed to one little thing like this. Look at John chapter 7, verse number 40. Because this is like what they're hanging their hat on. That Jesus is no good. That Jesus needs to be stopped. That Jesus isn't of God. That Jesus is of the devil. Look at verse number 40 in John chapter 7. The Bible says, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? So they're questioning, because Jesus, when he was a child, was in Galilee. Verse 42, hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the, the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. So basically, some people argue, well, wait a minute, I mean, he's coming out of Galilee, but the Bible says that, that Christ was going to come out of Bethlehem, out of, the, you know, where David was. So they're kind of confused. But you say, well, wait a minute. Let's just look at all this stuff. But you know what no one bothered to do? No one bothered to ask him. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a manger. And I don't think he would have lied if they would have asked him. But they just assume that because he's a child in Galilee, that that's where he was born. No, we already saw, in fact, he was born in Bethlehem. They went into Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They were going to go back home, but then they went into Nazareth. Why? Well, multiple reasons. 
but ultimately fulfilling all these different prophecies. All the different prophecies that followed his life in all those events. Amazingly. Down in verse number 52, it says, They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. They're just convinced. He's of Galilee and no prophet comes from Galilee. Well, they weren't listening to the other prophets that said he was going to be a Nazarene. And they didn't bother to ask him. Where was he born? Because he did fulfill those scriptures. The same way that many people can point to one thing, they see, oh, this is some contradiction in the Bible. That's why I'm just not going to believe the Bible. Maybe you don't know something. The Pharisees didn't know he was born in Bethlehem. But that, that was enough for them to reject it all. Don't be so foolish. Don't let anyone shake your faith in God's word over some minor thing that they want to call a contradiction. First of all, there aren't any contradictions. And I mean, I don't, I don't expect you just to take my word for it. Search it out for yourself. But in my own study, for a long time, I, I actually enjoyed looking at all the different supposed contradictions in Scripture because you know what? I've come across some of them that I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. That's kind of odd. This seems to be saying something different. But every time I actually figure out what it's saying or learn the truth about it, it's always amazing. It's always something really incredible. And that's one of the reasons why I like looking it up. And when I say incredible, I don't mean that, that I don't really mean the literal sense of incredible, like there's no credibility to it. So... Don't mistake me here. I just mean it's awesome. It's a better word for it. It's awesome. Because it truly is awe-inspiring how God works and how things can be true where at fir on first glance it might not see like, it just looks like a contradiction. But when you actually study and, and, and read it, and be careful about the words that are used. Just look at the words specifically. We just saw the prophets, plural, said that. Oh, it wasn't just one prophet. It wasn't written in some book. It didn't say the prophet Jeremiah, you know, wrote this. It says prophets, plural, and it says they spake it. It was spoken. It doesn't say it was written. Just like Jesus Christ, there's sometimes he says, you have heard that it had been said in old time. And some of the things that he says are not written in the Old Testament. Some of the things are, and this is where people get confused. Sometimes he makes statements like that, and it's coming straight out of the law. But other times he says things like that and it's not coming out of the law. And he doesn't say that it's ever the word of God just because something has been said. Like he said, you have heard that it's been said in old time that you should uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The Bible doesn't say to hate your enemy. It doesn't say that anywhere in scripture. So Jesus is saying, you've heard that it's been said. Why? Because people were saying it. Because religious leaders were saying it. He said, but I'm saying unto you that you love your enemies. But when you go back and study the word of God, you're going to find that it's consistent. It doesn't, it doesn't even say to hate your enemies. It's just been said. So be careful with what you read. Look at it carefully. Look at it closely. And if you weren't, you know, if, if this is something new to you, I know we have some visitors say, if it's something new to you, you haven't heard about, you know, like the King James Bible say, what is this guy talking about? Feel free to either talk to me after service or go home and, and look up on your own. Uh, if you just look up King James only or King James Version only, there is tons of information out there. I'm not saying it's all good, but you, there's, you do the research on your own. Look at the people who argue for it. Look at the people who argue against it. Look it up for yourself and decide for yourself what makes sense to you. It makes sense to me that God gave his word and that God preserved his word and that God wants us all to read one book, one Bible, so that we can be in unity. There's already enough disagreement. Even if you have one Bible, there's enough disagreements on what the Bible says. I don't think God wants there to be 400 different versions of the Bible to even add more confusion to the mix. 
Now, you just have to ask yourself, is God the author of confusion? Because I think the Bible says that Satan is the author of confusion. And if Satan's the author of confusion, and it's definitely confusing to have so many different books called the Bible out there today, all the more reason you have to be really careful with what, which book you're looking at. All right? And that's a challenge for you. If, you. if this is new to you, look it up for yourself. Talk to me. We've got documentaries. I don't know if we have any in stock anymore, but we give you a YouTube card and, and show you some information on that and kind of lead you in that direction. But um, any, anyone that's, that's a church member here will be able to help you out with that. So um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the, the great truth and wisdom that we could learn uh, in your word. God, I pray that you would please just help to Teach us and open up our understanding. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to understand the things that you'd have us to know. I pray that you please help us all to be diligent in our own studies and to search out, to seek out the things that we hear that are taught and we seek them out in your word and that we pray to you for, for guidance, Lord, and that we can judge in ourselves whether or not the, these things are, are true. And God, help us to, to put in the effort on our own and not to rely on what anybody says, but to look it up for ourselves so that we wouldn't be um, easily deceived by any, by any teachers out there, Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.